uh, from Tilbury. He modeled himself on the Cray twin. He believed he was untouchable. He convinced those around him that if they stayed with him, they would be exactly the same. This is Patrick Tate from Basildon, one of a team of criminal hardmen known as The Firm. He thought he was immortal, and he thought he could be Mr. Big. This is Kevin Whitaker, small-time drug dealer also from Basildon. He made the wrong friends. One, dead in a ditch. One, blasted to death in a lonely country lane. One, serving 17 years in prison. Tonight, the London programme reveals the new face of gangland Essex. reports at three a triple murder hunt is on after a gangland style killing in Essex police say they were shot dead at point blank race. Whitney Houston's I will always love you is to be played to ecstasy victim Leah Betts tonight her parents Janet and Paul are hoping her favorite song will get through to her as she lies in a coma after a reaction to an ecstasy and try to find a clown's mask he used to disguise a gunman who shot a patient in an Essex hospital it comes as a youth has been arrested and charged over the death of ecstasy girl Leah Betts Police say there's no evidence. Essex, this is Basildon, largest of the new towns of southeast Essex. In the 1960s, it was a planner's dream, a model environment in which families could flourish in comfort and security. But today, its image is tarnished by a wave of violence, drug deaths, and organized crime. And it was here in 1992 that police first became aware of a new and dangerous player on their patch. His trademark, violence. Backs of hands burnt with hot, hot iron. Uh, talks about the incident but will not make a statement for further reprisals. Um, forced entry into a, a person's home, noxious liquid sprayed about and the television shot out with a sawn-off shotgun. Another man here was shot at uh, close range uh, with a firearm, a handgun. Uh, taken to hospital, but again, no, no complaint made. The attacks all led back to one man, Jason Vella. He had emerged from nowhere to head a violent gang dealing in millions of pounds worth of drugs. Police were unable to persuade any of his victims to talk. Such was the fear he inspired. Most astonishing of all, he was just 22 years old. A young man with a desire to get to the top of the criminal hierarchy, um, a way about him that was that sometimes could be very charming and other times very cold and calculating. Faced with a wall of silence and fear, detectives set up a task force to trap Vela. Operation Max, as it was known, would involve over 40 officers and last two years and it would prove to be a high point for police in their ongoing battle against the new breed of criminals who are bringing the Wild West to Essex. London. At the end of the last war, this city had a massive housing problem. One solution was to move a large part of the population away from the smoky, noisy and crowded capital when the Essex new towns like Basildon were built, they attracted thousands of families from the old East End. A feature of the town centre is the much photographed mother and child statue by Maurice Lambert, which symbolises Basildon as a town for the young. Just around the corner from the market is Basildon's impressive town square. As the Londoners moved into Essex, a darker side of the East End moved with them. The tradition of the craze and organized crime lived on. Alan Dixon is a convicted gang member and one-time henchman of the craze. What it is, is an borderline from the East End to Essex. Now that borderline is so thin that when people grow up, sons and daughters, 
to Essex. Now, when the mums and dads went, that was villains and gangsters, they went to start afresh and make it right. And, and, and by them moving out there, they're, whether it was a criminal empire or whether it was working straight, that was their life. But while the traditional location of organised crime was changing, so too was crime itself. The age of the drug dealer had arrived. Years ago, when you've done security vans, robberies, banks, whatever, then I can make that right for the day. But it's 1996 now, and it's all drug-related now. Socially, money-wise, it's drugs. Well, the, the, classic, um, the classic drug baron or, or, or high-profile criminal moving into Essex, um, they invariably uh, pick uh, a, a reasonably secluded area. They want to sort of gentrify themselves. The, the money, they think, buys them um, seclusion in the country. Uh, you'll suddenly see uh, the house down the road or the, the cottage uh, and a, a couple of acres of land built and suddenly it will sprout a, a big extension, a six foot high wall, uh, electronic gates, security lights and a brace of Rottweilers called Fang and Tyson. Um, and that's your new neighbour. 37 year old Patrick Tate lived in Basildon but he had spent 10 years of his life in prison for robbery and drugs offences. Even inside, he kept up his obsession with bodybuilding. Bryn Mount Lodge in Fobbing belonged to 38-year-old Tony Tucker from Stratford in the East End. Tucker ran a firm of bouncers and was proud of his association with the boxer Nigel Benn. Along with 26-year-old Craig Rolfe, the three called themselves The Firm. They used their nightclub connections to control the supply of drugs to clubs like Raquel's in Basildon, where 18-year-old Leah Betts bought the ecstasy tablet that killed her. Lizzie Fletcher from South End was Pat Tate's girlfriend. He used to take over like a corner of the club. He's kept himself to themselves. If no one bothered them, and they was all right. It's just self to the little corner they was, laughing, laughing, laughing. Everyone would move out of the way. Goes, you wait, Lizzie. He goes, you'll have PT stamped on your head. I said, what do you mean? He goes, Pat Tate. Goes, you'll have it on your head. I said, oh. Girls, it was true. It was. It was really true. It's like that. People know that he was with him. And... <laughs> PTs. It was different. It was so different to anything I've had before. It made me feel so secure. Come here. Come here, monster. <laughs> Tate had a two-year-old son from a previous relationship. He was just a lovable, like Mr. Bear. You know, he um, just got in with the wrong crowd, I suppose. But there was a darker side to Tate. He had a history of violence, fueled by a serious drug problem. He wasn't one to brood or um, get vengeance or anything on anybody. He, if he did anything like that, it was when he was full up with drugs and he was just explosive. I think the heroin had, uh, that had destroyed him so much that he thought he was immortal and he thought he could be Mr Big. But Tate was murdered, along with the other two members of the firm, on a freezing winter night last December. The three were discovered blasted to death in their Range Rover near Rettenden. It was one of the most dramatic gangland executions ever, with no clues to how the men were lured to the spot and killed with such brutal efficiency. No, we won't mention that. Two months on, Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley is still grappling with the mystery. This case is a classic detective story. Um, it is not often that we get these days the chance to actually um, pit our wits and our expertise uh, against um, other people who have perpetrated a crime such as this. 
This is the, um, the main road, the A130 road that leads from Rettenden to Chelmsford. They would have come along uh, this road at about, um, we believe, probably six o'clock in the evening. The lane is, uh, is quite difficult and in dark conditions would have been a, a very sinister place to meet anyone. The site that we discovered, of course, was gruesome. The Range Rover actually stopped just here and uh, it was facing this, uh, this gate. There was absolutely no sign of a struggle whatsoever. Um, Rolf was sitting in the driver's seat, um, still with his foot on the brake. He, he was still holding the steering wheel as if he'd stopped at traffic lights. Tucker also was sitting in the front passenger seat um, uh, in a casual manner, was uh, holding a mobile phone in his hand. Tate um, was half leaning uh, with his head into the broken window, but again he was holding a mobile phone and there was no sign of him making any attempt to, uh, to leave the vehicle because he thought that he was in danger. Dibley's team is still trying to piece together the events of December the 6th, but one thing is clear, the killings were a ruthless demonstration of power in an increasingly violent Essex underworld. The firm based their operations at Basildon, but they were just one of a number of violent drugs gangs operating in the area, including Jason Vellas. His world of drugs, intimidation and torture stretched throughout South Essex, from Tilbury to South End. The bleak marshes of Tilbury provided the backdrop to Jason Vellas' upbringing. Well, he was always a happy-go-lucky child. He had asthma, so he was in hospital a lot, but he's never let it get him down. Um, just a happy child. Never got into fights at school. In class, the young Jason was bright and popular. In the holidays, he earned money working on his parents' market store. I'm disappointed that he didn't get a, a good job, because he's got the brains there to do it. I don't think he's used his full potential. And I think he could have had a career in... You know, probably if he was a bit more clever, he could have had a career in the stock exchange. But as Vella grew up, he became fascinated with gangsters like the Crays. He had a almost hero worship of the Cray twins uh, the, from the East End of London. Um, he was certainly in possession of the tape of their their life story, and uh, which I again given to understand was played very regularly to the point of it was almost worn out. His mother believes Bella started to go off the rails when she and his father divorced. I feel a bit that I've neglected him because because of my divorce I was very depressed. I had a breakdown on his 20th birthday so I do feel that I didn't give him the attention he needed at that critical time of in, in his life. I don't uh, think Jacob was an angel by a long means but I don't believe he was the big person he was supposed to be. Vella's image of himself as a latter-day Cray showed itself in the perverse style he brought to his assaults. He would take his victims to lunch before subjecting them to degrading and terrifying ordeals. One man described this attack to police. All of a sudden, there were a lot of blokes in the kitchen, and they all pulled out knives, like big kitchen knives. Jason started chopping at my hair. I remember a razor was also used. The man, an associate of Bella's, was forced to snort 12 lines of cocaine and lick LSD from a dog bowl. Bella then took this Polaroid of him. The man's crime? He had sent a Christmas card to Bella's girlfriend. Another victim attempted to restrain Bella in a pub argument over money. His identity is hidden as part of the police's witness protection scheme. That was a lunatic. He seemed a nice bloke at first when I met him, but he's, I don't know, he's just like, possessed. Like he had the devil in him or something. Can't remember which one it was, but they produced a meat fork from inside their jacket and started jabbing me with it. And then they got a knife out of the kitchen and started like, stabbing me with that. Well, I mean, if you take a full pelt kick, like while you're on the floor, in the ribs and in the head and... I was kicked in the privates, have your feet stamped on. All my arms were swollen, my head was swollen. I was totally disfigured. You were terrified? Oh, yeah, I still am now. 
Bella's activities across a large swathe of southeast Essex brought in huge profits. He led a very good lifestyle, uh, fast cars, good clothes, frequent holidays abroad, and um, at 22 years of age, he was living way above his means. Um, from our inquiries and subsequent uh, property recovered, one drug dealing book alone recorded drug deals of 1.2 million. Vela was lavish with his profits. On one occasion, flying a group of mates to Las Vegas for a world title boxing match. But back in Essex, he was bringing drug dealing to the school gates. King John's School in Benfleet was one of several targeted. We had a, a boy who had associated with uh, boys in other schools who were dealing drugs. We became suspicious of him and we found uh, a book with lists of names, uh, numbers after the names. What Ian Yeomans had found was a tick book, a record of drug deals. I suspect that in this case, a lot were drawn in, wanted to get out and couldn't. I, I'm basing what I say on a very small uh, involvement of, of one of our pupils, but from what we picked up from those we questioned, there was a great deal of fear that they were terrified of the, the people who supplied the drugs. Ian Yeoman's story helped police to build up a picture of the way that Vela's gang worked, but it still wasn't enough. The crucial breakthrough came from an extraordinary sequence of events, culminating in another of Vela's trademark punishment beatings. And for once, he wasn't able to slip off the hook. Jason Vela had been caught on camera. Vela rented a maisonette in Holland Walk, Pitsy. It was here in July 1993 that he brought Reggie Nunn, one of his dealers, to discuss a debt of £7,000. And what I would describe as a court was held with Vela and a number of his associates. Nunn was required to explain where the money, the £7,000, was. He couldn't. He was attacked, beaten and kicked with uh, fists and feet. A sword was then produced. He was stabbed with that sword. This is how Reggie Nunn described the attack in a statement to police. Bella was walking about and said, there's blood on my settee, get on the floor, stop whimpering like a little boy. He said to me, you know it just ain't gonna end here, Reg, with a few slaps and swipes. Nunn overheard Bella saying he'd be kept overnight and finished off in the morning. In panic, he dived through this upstairs glass window, falling 17 feet to the ground. Remarkably, Nunn's desperate escape bid was caught on police surveillance video. He's just landed off screen to the left. Now he appears staggering into a neighbor's doorway, begging for help. Bella's associates emerged to make their getaway before police arrive, pausing to promise none they'll be back for him. Soon after they leave, a second neighbor comes to his rescue. Nunn's agony is clear as he hobbles from the scene. Finally, Bella's girlfriend appears and gets into her car, followed by Bella himself, completely unaware that this film was about to bring his empire crashing down. Nunn's right leg was shattered in the fall. He agreed to give evidence against Bella in exchange for a new identity. In all, four key witnesses were given new identities for testifying against Bella, the most widespread use of witness protection ever by Essex police. After a four-month trial at Woolwich Crown Court, Judge Alan Simpson sentenced Bella to 17 years in prison, telling him, you set yourself up as a criminal sire in South East Essex, imposing your will on others in a regime of torture and terror. Court documents record Vela's response. As Vela left the dock, he turned to the judge and said, fuck you. He then acknowledged Mr. Bright by saying, and you. The czar of Essex crime is out of action.
but he leaves behind a vacuum which rival dealers are fighting to fill. As this new generation of drug barons vies for control of the lucrative dealing market, violent turf wars are inevitable. In the last year, police have had to deal with over 50 armed assaults, many of them drug-related. Meanwhile, the drugs continue to flood into Essex. Customs hauls of ecstasy were up 20% last year, and figures obtained by the London programme reveal an astonishing tenfold increase in police seizures of the drug. As the new breed of Essex gangsters has found, the county is perfectly located for importing drugs. It's beautifully positioned, of course, geographically. It's uh, got the, the, the coast with the inlet areas, the ports of drugs coming in. Um, it's got plenty of warehouse space if you want to stash drugs. And it's got a lovely network of roads coming from the ports into the M25 network. It's a perfect spot for, you know, if you're a drug dealer, it's the, the number one spot to be operating from. There's a lot of money now. And where there's a lot of money, you get a lot of villainy. Where there's a lot of villainy, you get a lot of violence. And where there's a lot of violence, you're going to get death. Kevin Whitaker was a victim of the drug wars. In November 1994, he was found dead in a ditch near the Essex village of Dunton. Well, you feel, you feel like he's let you get let Yes, down. you feel betrayed to a degree, don't you? And he, he betrayed himself, he betrayed his son, if you like. Let everybody down. But he's not here to defend himself. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know what happened, why he did it how he became so heavily involved and why, in the end, it became necessary to get rid of him. The post-mortem found that a bizarre cocktail of drugs had been injected into Whitaker's body. For a start, he was terrified of needles and he was right-handed and the three needle marks were found in his right arm. And it was afterwards that we sort of, I suppose, we began to put two and two together. But all of a sudden, he was saying, I want to go. I'd like to get out of Basildon. Um, it's not a nice place now. The coroner returned an open verdict. But Whitaker's death has been linked to the firm, and Craig Rolfe in particular. I know for a fact that Craig killed Kevin. You know, because when Pat was in hospital, they went in laughing and telling Pat what they'd done to this fellow. And then Pat was telling me he'd injected him with Special K, which numbs the body, but the brain's still working. Then he injected him with two injections of cocaine and then threw him in a ditch. Why did he do that? Because he'd previously he'd stolen £60,000 of the cannabis off of him. But Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley rejects any link between Whitaker and the triple killing. And for the first time, he reveals in detail what he believes happened near White House Farm last December. I actually favour that it could be one of their own gang, a, a person who had the same status as them um, and uh, w was able, if you like, to call the team together at short notice and to make a meeting in an isolated spot such as this. And I believe that uh, three shots were used initially to uh, kill these people and then the killer must have reloaded the gun and fired the additional shots. I think there was an element of, of vengeance attached to this and, uh, you know, the man had no need to fire these extra shots into, into them. Dibley believes the discovery of Tate's gun at his home backs up this theory. Tate never went anywhere without the weapon if he felt in danger. The final piece in Dibley's jigsaw is that three men died but there was actually only one target, Pat Tate. And I believe uh, quite firmly that he could easily have um, upset other members of what was a fairly slick organisation who felt uh, fearful that he was trying to get into their uh, domain and maybe take over uh, a gang position that he didn't deserve. People will kill for drugs. People will kill for drugs. Because uh, there's so much money involved, they will. And they won't get fucked by anybody. There's a lot of money. For Ivan Dibley, the triple killing will almost certainly be followed by others. Their um, demise certainly caused a void in the, in the drug world. And there will be no shortage of people wishing to take their place and to secure high profits from dealing in drugs.